What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Shadowrun Hong Kong, specifically the Extended Edition. Just to get a few things out of the way right off the bat, if you're new to my channel, I like to review games after 100% to set me apart from other reviewers on YouTube, as well as lend myself some credibility. These reviews actually include a wide variety of things, not just the achievements, but the achievements are included. And if you're curious about everything it entails and you go to my channel, the first thing you're going to find if you are not subscribed is a video explaining what these reviews entail. If you're curious, my Steam profile is public and linked in the description. You're welcome to check it out. But jumping into our review from there, Shadowrun Hong Kong was originally a Kickstarter project in January of 2015. Now this Kickstarter was primarily to add additional features to the game that was going to release regardless. However, the Kickstarter allowed them to add quite a few extra things to the game, and ultimately the game was released in its full version in August of 2015. However, in February of 2016, it received an extended edition. The extended edition both added several missions to the end of the game as a separate campaign that kind of wrapped some of the loose ends from the main story up, as well as fixed a lot of the remaining bugs, etc. Now that's an important note because Shadowrun Hong Kong has multiple endings and you can import your save into the DLC, and depending on the ending from the main game, you can get one of a couple endings for the secondary bonus campaign as well. But the game itself is an isometric CRPG. It is, of course, turn-based. In terms of difficulty, you pretty much have your easy, normal, or hard. Honestly, though, as far as turn-based games go, this one isn't bad at all, especially coming from Shadowrun Dragonfall which has a bit more of a focus on combat, Hong Kong actually allows you to avoid a lot of the combat and does away almost entirely with the waves of enemies that we saw in Dragonfall, so honestly, Hong Kong is a much easier game. But from there, to set up the story a little bit, I won't be spoiling too much of it outside of like the general plot setup. Unlike the predecessors to this game, Returns and Dragonfall, this particular game has a fairly set-in-stone background for your character. You and your adopted brother Duncan were orphans on the streets of Seattle when you were taken in by a man named Raymond Black, who was apparently a difficult-to-live-with elderly Chinese man. Your character at some point ran away for one reason or another, and wound up in a corporate prison for eight years. In Shadowrun, corporations largely rule most governments. If not directly, then indirectly. Now, after eight years, you are finally released from this prison only to receive a phone call from your estranged father asking you and your adoptive brother to come to Hong Kong and help him. Upon your arrival to Hong Kong, you meet with your adoptive brother Duncan, but unfortunately, you are almost immediately attacked by police labeled terrorists and forced to work for the Triad, who give you work as shadow runners in exchange for protection from the police while you try to sort this mess out. So you take on missions to help the Triad while they help you investigate what is going on with your father. And that's the basic setup for the game. And obviously it gets a lot more interesting than that. There are a lot of choices throughout the game that you can make that do actually have some fun consequences. And in total, there's about four endings. There is the best good ending, if you will, which requires talking to a lot of people as well as just triggering some dialogues. But honestly, nothing too crazy. I think as long as you're really thorough about talking to everyone in between missions, you will likely have the option for the best ending, if you will. But there are four in total, and you will largely choose them at the end of the game, at least for the main campaign, of course. Now that brings us to character creation. So character creation is largely unchanged for the most part. Now we do, of course, see a new UI, which is mostly present throughout the game. The UI in general saw some tweaks across the board that kind of help it be a little more manageable. But character creation in particular actually did see an update, at least in part, with the addition of a cyberware line. But beyond that, it largely functions the same way it's functioned in the previous games. It is a system that uses karma as experience points with the cost of upgrading stats and their related skills increasing as you add points. So the first point in something will cost one karma, the second will cost two, and so on and so forth. But you do have to raise the parent attribute of a skill in order to raise the appropriate skill to that level. So if I only have like three quickness, then I can only put three points into the associated skills that quickness is related to. 
Now you start the game with a bit less karma overall if you choose the free form class mechanic because while there are classes which serve as a jumping off point if you want, you can also choose to be a classless person who just assigns karma however you want. But overall, you'll start the game with a slight bit less karma than Dragonfall. However, you do get a lot more karma just throughout the game than you did in Dragonfall. So much so that here in character creation, I did want to mention that this was the first of the three Shadowrun games where towards the end of the game, I actually felt like my build was complete for once. Where Dragonfall, I, had, I definitely had a build, but I didn't feel like I had finished it by the time the end of the game rolled around. Whereas Hong Kong, I felt like I had finally made the character I had been trying to make. Now that of course brings us to the world building. Much like Dragonfall, at least mechanically, this game is really about taking on missions from a central hub. Now in this central hub, which is basically just the triad's base of operations that the police tend to give a wide berth, in between missions you'll be able to talk to NPCs, occasionally take on side quests throughout the little triad home area, and you'll be able to just go on missions in general. Some story critical, some not so much. And throughout this hub you are going to find classic specific vendors, much like you did in Dragonfall. However, whereas in Dragonfall, all of the armor that these vendors sold had class-appropriate bonuses on it, whereas the armor that you'll find in Hong Kong only gives you an armor value. They stripped the extra bonuses off of the armor, so the only thing armor really is outside of its armor rating in this game is a cosmetic choice, which is just an interesting little change I wanted to point out. But beyond that, if you are a hacker, then there's one particular vendor you need to talk to. If you need ranged weapons, there's a vendor. If you need cyberware, there's a vendor for that. If you need magic, you're going to go to that vendor, etc. Now, when you actually go on missions from this main hub, you will of course be able to assign companions to your team of four, you will potentially have up to five companions though, so you do have to choose who's going to come along with you. And then in addition to that, you can also hire mercenaries, much like the previous games, to also go on these missions with you, should you need the services of one specific type of character, for instance. Now, while you're out in the missions, overall, they're shorter than the missions in Dragonfall, and that is mostly due to the fact that there are less enemies in them. In Dragonfall, a lot of combat was the focus. There was these waves of enemies that would come at you. And then in Shadowrun Hong Kong, we actually see, in some cases, missions where you can completely avoid combat, provided you can pass the appropriate skill checks in dialogues, etc., to just skip a lot of the fights. And overall, throughout this game, there is much less of an emphasis on combat in the missions, unless you explicitly go loud. Which is definitely an option, but my point is you can actually avoid a lot of it this time around. And even when you are engaged in combat, it's less about waves of enemies than Dragonfall was. Also, these missions like to explore some different concepts. You see a mission that involves vampires, as well as ghouls and their role in the world and how they have to eat human flesh. The topic of essence comes up a lot. If you're unaware, essence in this game is something that makes a person a person. And when you get cyberware, you actually lose some of your essence. And if you were to go to zero or below in terms of measurable essence, you would either just basically be a robot or dead, which means there's kind of a hard cap on the amount of cyberware you can get and still be effectively a person. And this game does a good job of exploring concepts about corporations' attempts to remove that limit and how having less essence affects certain people, etc. And as this game is set in China, there's a lot of discussion around the concept of qi and qi energy because in the Shadowrun universe, we are of course living in an awakened magical world. Because in this universe, the doomsday that was supposed to happen in 2012 was actually a marker for magic returning to the world because it ebbs and flows out of the world in cycles. So during this awakened period of time in the Shadowrun universe, chi is less of a concept and more of a reality, and it is a tangible, measurable, magical force. So you see a lot of that explored in a lot of the missions. But truthfully, if you've played the previous Shadowrun games, it's a lot of more of the same type of stuff. It's a cyberpunk meets magical dystopia, except this time you explore how that affected a different culture as opposed to the previous titles, basically. Now, I did want to mention one more thing. While you're in between missions, you will of course be doing things like talking to your companions, talking to characters around the central hub, and just kind of absorbing information. Now it's worth mentioning that this information in this particular game largely comes at you in a significant amount of text. The game is not voice acted, which means the information is delivered through text boxes, which is great, but just know that there is a lot of text. 
Like a lot of these CRPG style games that aren't voice acted, you're basically reading a small novel. Now, I will say I did really appreciate the quality of the writing in this particular game. A lot of the conversations felt very natural, and I honestly think some CRPGs could really stand to take away some notes from how this game was written, because while you might not individually like the story, I think the quality of said writing, as well as, again, the flow of conversations is really admirable on the part of harebrained schemes for this one. But just know there is a ton of dialogue, and with the game focused less on combat as opposed to Dragonfall, there is a lot to read in this game. Now, let's talk combat a little bit. Combat, much like its predecessors as well, is of course a turn-based action point system, and truthfully, it is almost identical to Dragonfall with the addition of a few different types of weapons, basically. So when it comes to magic, you'll now get bouncing spells. You'll get things like chain lightning and just spells that are able to bounce between enemies. You also get cyber weapons, which was something missing from the previous games, but now your weapons can actually just be cyber weapons and you don't have to say purchase separate ranged weapons for that character. But largely speaking, it's just the same system of combat from Dragonfall with some slight tweaks that make it feel better to play. But keep in mind, as I mentioned, there is less combat overall. So in addition to it feeling better to play, you truthfully won't interact with it as much as the previous titles. Now there are a few things I wanted to mention here as well though. In this particular game, I wanted to talk about the hacking mini game that I haven't really talked much about in the previous reviews. And that is if you are using a Decker, which you most assuredly will be, because Deckers are a very important class, but Deckers are effectively your hackers in this game. They can project themselves into the Matrix, which is like a 3D representation of the internet, and they use this to hack things, but it's called decking. Now, in the previous iterations of this, you were effectively just taken to a separate combat stage where your character would fight against programs with programs of their own as they ran around and tried to access data nodes. And honestly, I have not liked this minigame throughout this entire series. I will say it is in its best version in Hong Kong, but even here, I am not a fan. Now, in Hong Kong, you actually have the potential to try to stealth your way around some of these programs, which makes it feel a little more involved and fun rather than just a separate combat stage, which is effectively what it was previously. So they definitely added some elements that I think make it more interesting. But overall, just across the series, I can't help but feel like this little mini game just isn't very fun. And I don't really know how much it adds to the series. Like I'm sure some people love it, but it's just not for me, to be honest which is why I wanted to see it in all three games before I gave like a hard opinion on it. And last thing I wanted to mention about the combat, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to get more karma in this game than all of the others, which again leads to you having a more complete character in my opinion, which is why at the end of this game, I felt like a much more powerful character than I did in the previous entries. But with that out of the way, that brings us to companions. Now, three of the companions you're going to meet very early in the game. Now, one of them is your adoptive brother, Duncan, who you met with when you arrived in Hong Kong. Duncan is an orc that is working for the private police known as Lone Star, or at least he was before you two were labeled as terrorists at the beginning of the game. So he's kind of stuck with you. You can talk with him a lot about your estranged father and kind of establish what your relationship with these two was. So that's something... And then the other two that you meet at the beginning of the game are Isabel and Gobbit. Isabel is a dwarf decker. She's probably going to be the one that's doing most of your hacking if you yourself are not a decker. Because deckers are basically mandatory, you kind of need one pretty much all the time. She, alongside Gobbit, the orc street shaman, grew up very poor and have been friends for a very long time. Isabel, of course, loves all things electronic, and you can help her work through some of her memories of the past. Gobbit is, again, a street shaman, but specifically, she is a shaman of the rat, which means her totem spirit is the rat. So she has pet rats, and much like most shamans, she's primarily a support caster. And despite herself being very young, she tries to be like your mentor and teach you lessons about shadow running through stories, which again are pretty dialogue heavy, but you do eventually get to kind of see the remnants of her old crew through her companion mission, and I thought it was well done. Now, the other two companions you get are actually missable. The first one is Raktor, I believe it is. This is a Russian drone specialist who lives in the bottom of your safe house. Now he's kind of there regardless, but you can talk to him and invite him to join your crew of Shadowrunners. 
If you don't like him, however, you could also just not do that, but there's really no reason not to do it, but it is an option. So he is potentially missable nonetheless. Now, Raptor has a very interesting story that I don't want to ruin too much, but suffice to say, he is a very standoffish drone specialist who is very intelligent and known for his work on pioneering drones. And then last but not least, we have Gaichu. Now, Gaichu is actually a ghoul. You'll meet him very early on in one of your missions. He, however, as a ghoul, has been slighted by the people you are doing a mission for. But ultimately, you can choose to help him or kill him as he is a ghoul. Now, if you're unaware, ghouls in the Shadowrun universe have to eat human flesh to live. Most of them are little more than feral ghouls. Not all that dissimilar from another type of fantasy. Some ghouls, however, are able to retain their will, but most of them just simply don't make it because most people just kill them outright. And it is very, very obvious when someone is a ghoul, so most intelligent ghouls don't last very long. As there is, for starters, very few of them, but combine that very few with the fact that they now have to live a life of isolation, lest they just be murdered in the street, and you've got a recipe for just a lot of ghouls not making it. But Gaichu is very interesting because he used to be a member of the Red Samurai of a corporation before he was ultimately turned into a ghoul, and you can kind of talk to him about that life. But he himself is a melee samurai character, which I thought was really cool. He can be very effective as well as, as he gets attacks that take action points away from your enemies. So used effectively, he can be a very strong character. And of all of the companion quest lines in this game, his was easily my second favorite. Now, with that out of the way, let's talk the little DLC extended edition type thing before we wrap this thing up. So the DLC basically wraps up a few of the loose ends from the main story. So what you'll do is you'll import your save from the epilogue of the main campaign, which will then import your decisions, of course, into the little DLC area. But the primary thing to watch out there for is really the endings. And I'll say this about the DLC. The beginning of it is very railroady. I feel like they could have wrote a few different ways around this problem and still wound up at the same result, but they really went out of their way to just railroad you down one particular path that I really just don't think was necessary, and they take away a lot of the player agency for seemingly no reason. But that said, the little DLC itself is about four or five missions in total. It's not super long, but it will see you fighting against the police corruption, specifically the person that pursued you through a lot of the main campaign that was present when you were labeled terrorists right at the beginning of the main campaign, actually. And the ending of this particular bonus campaign sees you ultimately given the decision to continue shadow running or potentially return to your normal life. And while overall I liked this, I think the ending was a little lackluster. I think they could have kept everything the same, like up to the last fight, like mechanically and everything. I don't think they needed to add anything, but the ending options you get, I feel like they could have just added more options that would have been literally just typing up text and made it so much better. For instance, there's an ending that leaves your brother very cross with you, but you could have just easily wrote around that with a bit more text involved that would have been like, hey, let my brother go back to his life, but I want to continue shadow running. But for some reason, they kind of force you as a pair to make that decision, and it just doesn't make a lot of sense, and I feel like they could have wrote some more ways around this pretty easily. So outside of those instances of just the writing kind of pigeonholing you into decisions a lot, the DLC was fine otherwise. But let's talk positives, negatives, wrap this thing up. So positives, it's more Shadowrun. If you like the previous Shadowrun titles and you want to explore more of that, but in a different culture, here you go. I liked it a lot. It was very interesting to see just concepts of like chi and stuff and just a different culture expressed in this particular iteration of Shadowrun. So that was really cool. I think the improvements made to the gameplay make it much more palatable. I'm glad that they got rid of the nonsense amount of enemies from the previous title, Dragonfall. And I'm glad that I finally got enough karma to make the character that I wanted to make. But on the negative side of things, there is no voice acting, there is a nonsense amount of dialogue, and as such, there is just a ton to read. The other negative for me was that they really force your character to be like a set person in a game where typically speaking, it's all about role playing and making up your own background. And while they do let you kind of define what that relationship with your estranged father and your brother was, it is nonetheless a much more set in stone background than games like this typically like to present to you. And while it wasn't bad, I think again, the quality of the writing is really a standout. But for me personally, that was just a negative point. 
especially when combined with the extended bonus campaign DLC thing, which also really railroads you into making certain decisions that I feel easily could have been written around. It sometimes just kind of feels like they're forcing you down a specific path. But let's draw a conclusion and wrap this thing up. Now, as I've mentioned in previous reviews for this series, you are unlikely to buy this game individually. You are likely going to buy it as part of the Shadowrun trilogy which full price is $55, but you can get it on a deep, deep discount regularly. The extended edition itself is actually $20 regularly, which I actually do think is a very fair price for the title. But because it's on sale so regularly, because it's an older game, you might as well wait for a sale at this point if you haven't already played it. But I do think it's worth full price money. So there you go, my final review for the Shadowrun trilogy. I will likely be making a video kind of talking about the series as a whole in a few days or so. But in the meantime, I really hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you enjoyed the review. So truly, thank you so much for watching. Like, comment, subscribe, all that standard YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of it, again, thank you. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.